This is the Tabernacle Podcast with Adam Ray, Martin Rizzi, and me, John Vermillion. What's up, fellas? Good afternoon, sir. Good after. It's afternoon. It is. It is. It's a late podcast. I've only done a handful of podcasts in the afternoon, and I wonder if there's more or less energy in the room. We're about to find out. Well, today was a high energy day in the office, so I'm feeling energized. I'm not feeling like the post lunch, whatever. I don't know. How are you guys feeling? We just humiliated ourselves. I was just going to say, after that video, the only thing I'm feeling is I never want anything of me on the internet again. (laughs) This will destroy you. (laughs) The interesting part of that whole video is there was this um, kind of subtle revelation about five minutes ago that this was going on social media. You know, everybody just kept talking about like, this is for our staff. This is just for fun. Yeah. Welcome um, to the tavern. Yeah, I like. I feel like there will be months of humiliation <laughs> from what we just did. Yeah. So if you don't know what we're talking about, you will at some point soon. I don't know when it's going to drop. Mm-hmm. The creative arts department made slaves of all of us. They said, greatest staff video of all time. We're going to have a little fun. It took a couple hours of creatives bossing us around. Mm-hmm. And to get two minutes of footage. Two minutes two of footage. Minutes of yes. Footage. We were in costume. You were in costume. Oh, well, mm. All three of us were in costume. We were. Yeah. We were in costume. I wore a tie. <laughs> you look good in that tie. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you were. You were channeling Jim hard. <laughs> Rizzy was some sort of kung fu I'm not expert. Sure. I know what I could have been, and I, I'm glad in what I ended up. It was much better than it could have been. Well, uh, Benjamin was hoping it would be that hideous velour uh, tracksuit that you pulled out at the Christmas party. I don't know why you say that's hideous. There's no better look for me than It was a little suit. creepy when your wife says, hey, we like when he wears it around the house at Christmas. <laughs> I'm not sure the rest of us needed it. You'll have to see it. Red yeah, velour. I, I don't want to. <laughs> Just I know that in 20 years, it's going to fit very differently, but it'll still be my favorite outfit. Yeah, You're going to have a great. punch? Absolutely. You won't have a punch. Yeah. Oh, One I'm of the fittest guys it. I know. I tell my wife all the time. I'm like, after like 50, it's all down here, and I'm giving up. Like, I give up completely. You're going to be that Italian guy? Absolutely. Yeah, you're going to be making the... The ganoshi or yes. whatever they call it. And, and Pasta will actually be part of your diet then. It still is. Like okay. It is my entire diet. Is it gluten-free? No. How are you that fit? Because I eat a lot and then I work out a lot. That's literally the whole game. I do the same thing <laughs> and it's not working out. <laughs> no, when I left the house today, I'm in costume. And because I don't know when the video is going to drop, if you see the video, if you know, you know. And my wife looks at me, who she doesn't like creative things. And she's looking at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, this is how much I love our staff. This is how much I love, look, to be humiliated for the gospel. I don't know if it'll draw anybody to Christ, this video. It absolutely would. I happen to know that Jesus was in every scene of that video. I, I don't know about you, but- Why, because I, the Christ in us? No, the little, the little Christ. Oh, okay. All over the place. Little baby Jesus. You should probably hidden. stop about right now. <laughs> so- I, I love not telling my wife about things like this. One, because oh, yeah. how do you explain to you, like your wife that this is what I did at work today? But two, when that thing airs, I just like to look into her eyes and see that level of embarrassment of like, what did you do? Oh, honey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Same thing with Darcy. If I tell her in advance, it's yeah. not going to go well. Just let it happen later. You know. And then she just looks over. The, the, the other weird dynamic that I saw, and I don't know... We might have to edit this out, but I'm going to say it because I'm just sitting in a basement with some bros. Is I saw this, I saw my family dynamic playing out in the staff. So my daughter Lily is on contract here. She works for Lindsay making graphics and videos. She was at the heart of this thing, right? Same thing that happens with the staff today is what happens in our house. If Lily's not excited about it, we're not doing it. She's not bossy. It's just, but if Lily's excited about it, everyone's all in to the hilt. And I'm sitting here going, this girl has great power and yeah. she has no clue. Mm. So she'll kill me for saying that, but I don't think she listens to the podcast. That's okay. Right. You can blame it on me because I told her afterward, I go, we needed that. So bad. like in the midst of a campus launch and everything that's going on around here, we just spent some time having some fun together and it was hilarious. And we just got to see the absurdity of everybody. Like you can't put a price tag on that, that values so much. And you're right. We all want to do it because Lily thinks it's cool and we all think Lily's cool. So we're just like, all right, there you go. Oh, some of the characters, when you see it, John Williams stole the show, Christina yeah. Simon, yes. who knew she could roller skate backwards for real. Yeah. Introverts are amazing humans. Yeah. When they come out of their show. Exactly. So 
Well, what we're doing today is we're continuing our study. A couple podcasts ago, it might have been 130, 131. You can scroll, find it on wherever you're listening right now. Um, we started in the book of Philippians, and we just covered the first 11 verses. Uh, Paul wrote this um, awesome short book, but probably the most joyful book of the New Testament. I mean, besides uh, the joy that we see in the disciples when they encountered the risen Christ. Mm-hmm. But as far as the epistles, nothing has the joy of Philippians. And then when you read the context, Paul wrote this from prison. And it's like, wow. I know for me, and we already covered this last week, but um, there were different characters. I was here with uh, Adam Sharp, or as he likes to call himself, First Adam, mm-hmm. uh, which is dangerous theologically, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and Tim. I'm interested in your thoughts uh, of just generally uh, the fact that we have the most joyful book and Paul is writing it from prison. That taught me a lot, you know, in the dead of winter when it's after the seasons, it's between the seasons. I'm just waiting for the snow to melt. And even though it's 50 degrees today, your thoughts, just like what can we just learn from that on the book of Philippians written from prison with so much joy? Yeah, I think personally when you are, uh, when the sole driving force and passion of your life is the gospel, then all those external circumstances are just um, small things to encounter and to process and to utilize for furthering the gospel. And I think as we get into this, even today, there's uh, such an incredible perspective that he brings of uh, one of the my favorite. Is it okay if I say something I, from today? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, one of my favorite things that he says is that, or that we read, is that all of the jailers heard the gospel. Like he's jailers. Yeah. yeah. So he's just, he's on, on mission the entire time. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Even in Ephesians where he's in prison, mm-hmm. he's praying for boldness to share the gospel while locked in chains for having too much boldness sharing the gospel. Um, it's like the, he's unflappable or something. Yeah, because what, what was the word you use? He was single, single-minded. Mm-hmm. He was single-minded in his pursuit. And I don't just, I'm agreeing with you. For me, the challenge is, I don't think that's just because Paul, I call him the super apostle because he wrote most of the New Testament. That's not just for Paul. That needs to be for me. Mm. I'm, I can so easily be just down because of circumstances with the job, with ministry, with something with family or health or whatever. Rizzy, what do you think? No, I, uh, I think that when we look at this, the context of it says as much as much of the epistle. I mean, we, we get the details of, of what he has to share with us, but he's saying a ton in that moment of going, hey, I'm here, it's bad. And I don't think that's ignoring the reality of the suffering or the fact that he's in prison. He, may, he acknowledges it. And yet he sees joy and yet he sees the purpose. And I think purpose has a huge amount to do with this. He understood that those jailers needed Christ. He understood the gospel in in the depth of it and what it was necessary and what was necessary for him to do. He understood what Jesus went through in that same way. And that is where oh, joy begins point. to exude, yeah. right? Yeah. The way Jesus did in the same way. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Where yeah. he, I mean, Jesus suffered for the gospel more than any other man. Paul probably is the next best example of it. But he's acknowledging that and it's, it's you know, a testament to to the change in him. Mm. And for us, I think sometimes we're walking around the world frantic and complaining about everything in life and people don't really see the gospel in us. Um, I want to be more like Paul. Right. Right. I, if I'm honest, I'm not sure I do. Like, I, oh, sorry. I don't want to have to be in chains. Right. <laughs> but the attitude yeah, I'm exactly. talking about. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I got like, and you like to, I, I will admit, I constantly read this book and wonder, could I have? Mm. And the, the flaw there, I think, is I. Hmm. It had nothing to do with Paul and it would have nothing to do with me. It's got to be Christ in us. Otherwise, no, we've got no chance to be joyful in the midst of this mess. Well, we may never get to the study just for the discussion. Right. But uh, that reminds me, uh, again, for the hundredth time of the very first devotional you shared with our staff. Um, As our new executive pastor, Adam Ray, um, shares this wonderful uh, devotional. And I don't want to ruin it just in case you're going to no, sh- it. Share, it, share it with the whole church at some point. But um, the ball glass jar with Skittles, and there was only like three Skittles in the jar. And um, you were talking about what, what it takes to fill your jar. 
and how many times in life, whether you're in ministry or not, you feel like you're down to your last three Skittles and you were jingling them around. And I thought we were eating Skittles that day. We didn't get any. Well, we got Skittles later because he did put it by the buffet but um, or the potluck or whatever we're having. But the whole point without taking the whole time for the illustration was what if being down to three Skittles is where we're supposed to be because you were talking about dependency mm-hmm. and being dependent on God in those moments. And so to your point, Rizzy, um, Paul, it wasn't just he was an optimist. It wasn't just nothing could get him down. Things got him down. I have to assume beaten, stoned, uh, left for dead, chased out of town, jailed, freed, jailed again. Um, he had to live his life with this dependency on God. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't think it was Paul. Right. It couldn't be Paul because Paul's just a dude like we are. I can call him super apostle all day. He had to be dependent. Mm-hmm. And, and how, how much has he written? In, in fact, I think, and I forgive me, but I can't even remember the verse that you used to share with us, but I think it's something Paul wrote. Yeah, and it, it was, sure. and, and, you know, it's about him being dependent on Christ in those moments. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. And it, it speaks to the, to the life in ministry and I'm pretty sure everywhere else, right? I'm down to three Skittles and I think that's a bad thing. Um, now I look back, God just doesn't often reach me in good moments in my life. Um, I get really, really avoidant and I get really, really comfortable and, and I need a kick in the pants and God's good for it. He, he's uh, faithful in those moments to either kick me or allow me to be kicked and it's then remind me. Kick. It's a gentle yes. kick. A loving. Yeah. It's, a loving kick. Yeah. it's a grace filled. It's a prodding. Yes. It's a prodding kick. <laughs> Maybe we'll do Skittles as a whole podcast. That could work. And then, and then while you're breaking it down, we can just... It's good. That, that'll Anyways. sound awesome in the microphone. <laughs> <It's a little laughs> <jiggle> chicken. <laughs> well, this one right there, you know, so. I think that the key to that, though, is what our, um, since you alluded to it, the, in our own verbiage, we would state that the way that I fill my jar or my, um, to, to where I feel like I'm ready for ministry, ready to mm-hmm. preach uh, a lot of times we resort to worldly methods mm. that aren't bad. Like, obviously, we need rest. Obviously, we need vacation time, those things. Um, but I can remember some of the most disappointing sermons being the ones that I felt most prepared for. 100%. Because I walk up there to preach with this idea of, dude, I've I've nailed this. Like, I've I know it. this. Yeah. And uh, the ones that I walk up, having done my best to prepare, feeling completely insufficient and crying out to the Holy Spirit, and then you walk away from that and go and, how do I recreate that? That was amazing. <laughs> I can like, do that yeah. right? <laughs> People th- are coming up. To, yeah. The thousands are coming. The buses are waiting. There's an altar call and you're like, I don't even know what I said. Right. Yeah. That's a good place to be. Do you- I love it. So uh, verse 12, um, let me read it for us. Um, and then uh, and then we'll just get some knee jerk responses. We're going to do this fight club style. We're going to read what's it say. Um, if you're wondering how to study the Bible, one of the easiest way, what's it say? What's it mean? Now, how does it apply to my life or what's it mean for me? And so, um, yeah, here's the first part out of the ESV Philippians chapter one, verse 12. Um, this is after he's, uh, showing all of his affection for the people in verse nine, he says, "Of my prayer that your love will abound more and more, um, so that you may approve what's excellent and pure and blameless for the day of Christ. It's one of these glorious run on Paul sentences, um, where he finishes to the glory and praise of God. Then verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And so you could kind of split this passage into two parts, Um, the first being 12 to 14, and then the second is more about the motives. Let's just look at that 12 to 14. Uh, what, what from your knowledge or your study or from your notes or from your previous life, uh, 
previous, not previous life, but previous uh, <laughs> readings of Philippians. W- what has happened to Paul that he's saying that this has served to advance the gospel? Got any ideas? I, I thought you were going to go with my previous imprisonments and like make that connection. But Well, um, hey, you went there, so yeah. let's just talk about your previous imprisonments right uh, here. <laughs> I will say that there is nothing more eye-opening to realize where you are in life than that moment you're sitting in the back of a cop car and going, this is not how I want things to go. Talk to me. Uh, I've never been in the back of a cop car. <laughs> I got to remember most people haven't. It's still funny to see the look on people's face because somebody's going to listen to this podcast. That's going to be the first time they realize it. And they're like, oh, he wasn't joking. Um, but yeah, it sucks. It's, it's, uh, you start going back on all the decisions that you've made. You start realizing, all right, the consequences have caught up to me. You have no idea what tomorrow is going to hold. Now, the difference is I was wholly guilty. Yes. Literally every time um, I had done something to deserve it. Paul, on the other hand. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. This didn't come up in your staff interview. How many times, Rizzy? Six. Six, six, times. six times. Okay. You're now the authority something at this table. Like Go. Um, Sorry. But yeah, there, there's this reality of, okay, I, all my consequences have caught up with me. I am now going to pay for this. I have no idea how badly I'm going to pay for this. Mm-hmm. Boy, I hope my court appointing attorney is better this time. Like, there's a reality of how this is going to go. And Paul, despite the fact that this wasn't his fault, he d- had done nothing wrong, so to speak. He knew he was breaking Roman law. Like, he understood that he was probably inciting these riots and these issues and bringing himself to, and I, I'm going to need context because I don't remember exactly why he was imprisoned at this point, but I promise you he's going, I don't know how this is going to end. Mm. Um, in multiple times that Paul is in prison, he's, he acknowledges the fact that, all right, this, this could go poorly for me. And I can tell you from having sat there, that you start to wonder, and man, you can dream up like, I'm really going to, they're going to see everything else I've ever done. Oh my goodness, now I'm in trouble. And most of my arrests were fairly petty little things. But there were a couple of times where it was like, oh man, this might, like, at some point they're going to just label me a criminal. I'm not going to get off easy anymore. Mm. And then you look back 20 years later and you're still dealing with the repercussions of it. Mm. Well, uh, we can go into the details of, of the why, but the scripture tells us, uh, at least the general idea, it says, um, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard uh, so these are the shock troops of, of Rome or whatever, that my imprisonment is for Christ. Mm. So whatever it was, he, he knows he's guilty in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes, he's not guilty. Mm. So he's got a clear conscience, but maybe his, you know, maybe his flesh was experiencing some of the things that you're saying from yours was, but we don't see that in Paul. Right. He's like, this is for Christ. I got a brand new congregation right. <laughs> that's you know, inside the walls. Yeah, I I agree. I think the um the part that catches my eye every time is that uh what is happening to me serves to advance the gospel, mm-hmm. which helps us to constantly have Paul's heart in focus. Um I I think uh 2 Corinthians 5 uh says that Paul's two main motivators for ministry in uh verses 11 through 14 um are love and fear in this perspective of an awe of who God is, an awe of the Creator, and that um, passion to share the truth of who He found Jesus to be. You know, Paul's unique mm. just in the fact of his um, uh, how he came to Christ. Right. You know, the, none of us will ever be able to share that same story. Oh, that's such a cool story. Um, but he not only saw the exceeding wickedness of his past and past choices, but that a God saw him as the one that he was going to use to carry the gospel in a way that no one else will ever carry it in the missionary journeys and things that he's carried. And so there's this uh, this connection and this r- r- uh, relationship with God that's uh, frankly different than what most experience in their salvation conversion, um, uh, their conversion experience. And uh, he, it's uh, you almost read it like he's giddy, like yeah. um, this is this is only going to be able to help me share the gospel. Right, and right. you're like. Bro, you're in you're in jail, you're in prison, and he's just looking at the. Uh, I read one where, one place that uh, that whole imperial guard uh, would be potentially in the thousands. Really, and, and so just the opportunity for him to have a voice in that many people's lives. Um, I think you know if we look at our ourselves, like I don't want to jump too no, quickly bro. to the this to the good. application piece, but um, every circumstance that I'm in, 
is an opportunity to share the gospel. It at the least, it's an opportunity to invite somebody to church. Right. And um, I'm sure my kids, you know, get tired of it. Like, Dad, can we just please pump gas one time without yeah. you inviting yeah. the whole gas station? Oh my, yeah. But at the same time, there's a. Uh, the reality of who Christ is to me and the transformation of my heart and my life, um, I want people to experience it. Right. You know, and I think uh, that's the joy, the beauty of being at a church that you love is uh, knowing that they're going to come and hear the gospel preached and it's going to be proclaimed. And uh, I talk often about like um, that uh, a person has maybe witnessed a cycle of life Mm. that's awful that's ugly, it's gross, and there's sin and that re- repetition of sin generationally over and over and over, and then input the gospel, and it changes the entire course in the future. And I think Paul is witnessing that so much and so strongly in his own life, watching people change, watching hearts change, watching lives change, um, that he sees this as a just yet another opportunity. Oh, know? yeah. And in fact, when, when, when you were saying that, because, again, it's real easy for you know, someone in the podcast family to say, well, you know, this is three preachers that are talking about it, about another preacher. That's not for me. So part of the language of the tab is we talk about being a domino. And all that is, is seeing yourself in this long chain of dominoes where God, who Christ himself said, no one can come to me unless my father in heaven draws him first. And so my assumption is that means God is drawing people. I don't always know who he's drawing and who he's not drawing, my job is to, in every way, word, action, deed, wherever I am, like Paul, uh, see the opportunity. Mm. Um, so instead of making this about me, I'm thinking right now of one of my favorite people in the world. She's had a radical transformation of her life, of her family, um, and she happens to go to our church. She goes to Buckley campus, and she works at the general store. Mm. And uh, uh, I think I've shared this before. My kids have the same thing. I mean, there's times when my wife will say, hey, can I just run in and get the thing? Because if you go in, we're going to be here all day. Um, Part of it's because I talk a lot. But, you know, someone's going to reckon, you know, and it's just kind of the whole thing. Well, if I'm going into the general store, there's times I'm in a hurry. And I just want to get, you know, whatever, my Celsius, no free shout outs to Celsius or whatever it is and get out. The moment I walked through the door, hi, pastor, you know, and forever she did that. And, you know, I, I, I didn't have a bad attitude, but you know, it's like, like I'm stealing your camo. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in camo. It's like, oh, okay. So now we just pastor, you know, I, I didn't go high store manager, you you know, or whatever. But, um, but she finally pulled me aside and told me why she does that. And she, she said to me and, and she checked my little ego Mm. But she goes, I know you don't like that because you mentioned it in a sermon. I mean, and I told her I was going to do it. You know how your camo's gone the moment you walk in there. Mm-hmm. She started talking about all the conversations she gets to have with the next person in line. Mm. That's just like, who was that? That's my pastor. I go to the tabernacle. You should mm-hmm. come to church. Here's the thing. Yeah. I've got the cards, you know, or whoever she's working with. They all know now. But instead of the humdrum of a bad day, she's looking for opportunities to be intentional. And it's mm-hmm. changed everything about her face. I mean, the joy that if, if you haven't met her yet, you'll meet her. And then every time you go into the PGS, it's going to be, hey, new pastor, you yeah. know, and then it's another chance for her to talk about church or invite somebody. Yeah, awesome. So, so this is Paul. He's saying what has happened to me. So he's in prison. It's going to advance the gospel. Um, he also sees it as divine, it seems like, hmm. at, at least in verse 12. What has happened has served to advance the gospel, but I mean, Paul's aware that God's in control. Paul's not afraid. Right. Have you ever been in a place, a circumstance where it took you more than a minute or a day, a bad circumstance to realize maybe this is uh, going to serve to advance the gospel, like personally? Or mm-hmm. have you always been like, nope, I just remember this verse and I'm always good? No, I think a lot of times it's in the... Um, when we're searching for the why, because that's our human nature, um, the goal of my heart always is to just reaffirm the trust that I have in God through that circumstance, even though I you know, may, may know the why, I may never know the why. Um, I can think of uh, some specific times in our lives like um, 
I think I've mentioned this before and I don't need to mention it every time, but uh, it serves well in this space. Yeah. Rach um, and I, after um, Hudson went, had a miscarriage and I was, uh, I was in a tree stand, believe it or not. And I get a phone call. She's like, Hey, I think we just miscarried. And so I'm running across this chisel plowed soybean field. And I remember, you know, if you've ever tried to walk across a muddy chisel plowed soybean field, you know, no matter how fast you want your progress to be, it's, just, it's not. But the whole time that I was running across there, I was like, God, um, I trust you. I trust you. Mm. And I need to communicate that to my wife in a way where the natural tendency for her is going to be to, uh, what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the first place she's going right. to go. How did I fail? Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it was God protecting us from something, whether it was God preparing us for something, but I can't even put a number to the number of conversations that we've had since that time to be able to encourage hearts, challenge people to trust God, even in the face of poor circumstances, uh, the reminder that his character demands that he's good. And uh, I think, you know, when you read something like this about Paul, he's mm -hmm. literally sitting there going, God, you're so good. Right. Like I, I, I get to see the gospel being presented in a way that I never would have seen it before. And yet uh, he's not, you know, like he doesn't know the full effects of this time in prison yet. Right. Um, yet is willing to trust God in that circumstance. I think that's uh, such a powerful piece of that. No, that that's that's a beautiful part of that story mm -hmm. that you didn't share before. Mm -hmm. That is practical for me to learn yeah. from, for us to learn from. That what if my first reaction in whatever circumstance, it doesn't even have to be that dramatic, um, but choosing to trust and. And I like that picture of you saying the words out loud, you know, not, yeah, you want to say why. And there's a part of you that says that, but Hey, I'm just going to, from my head to my lips, at least that's at least halfway to my heart. <laughs> right. uh, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. That's a beautiful picture of who I want to be in those moments. Martin, what about you? Yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking about what he just said. There's an active choice involved to trust God. Now I'm just going to go ahead and confess. I'm, I'm still at a point where more often than not, it's easier to look back and then remind myself how God was faithful once I've seen it. Um, and I'm not going to say I don't have moments of maturity like that, but uh, it's easier for me to look back and see all of the moments in which I stumbled down the road and then went just frustrated through the whole time, not realizing it. And then I look back at the story and I go, all right, now I can see where God was faithful. And I think that for most of us, you know, I, I know Adam's story is a little bit different than mine. He he grew up around this. He understood this mm -hmm. innately in who he was. I did not. And there was a huge piece of my life where the idea of trusting a God seemed absolutely idiotic, um, especially in the worst times of my life. Every one of those times I joked about being in jail, uh, there was no trust in God there. There was a like, hey, I'm pretty sure there's a God. Maybe he can get me out of this. Like that's as close as I ever came to that. But looking back at the moments in, in mine and Cassie's life where we have seen God act, um, and I've, I've told the story publicly, but um, I won't go through it entirely, but there was a time in which in my former employer, I'm under investigation, I'm on the outs, like life is bad, and all I can see is that I'm probably going to lose my job here, and it pays pretty well, and I don't know what else I'm going to do, and man... I don't know why God would do this. Like last I heard from him, he wanted me to be a pastor of, like, of, of students. Like why in the world would he let me go through this? Hmm. All right, well, you know, I must be getting hired at somewhere. And uh, then they chose not to hire me. And then on top of that, uh, I get beat up along that process for a full six months, I think. I was under investigation and everything else. I can't tell you throughout that process, I'm going, I trust you, God. Not even close. I'm just going, God, I don't understand why. Why is this going on? It's a year later, and I'm sitting here at this church trying to sort out why God has put me into a pastoral position and just loving every moment of my life and looking back going, man, mm. I see what you are doing now. I could have never seen it then. Mm. And, and I think that's for a lot of us. Um, it takes maturity. It takes seeing God act a few times. It takes seeing it in others' lives. And I think that that's a responsibility we have to our children is to help give them some of that out of our life because mm. you got to build some momentum somewhere, right, before you can trust God. Because trust for most of us, at least those with trust issues like me, it's built over time. We need to see 
how this is going to act. And maybe that's faithless. Um, I, but I don't know that I came to God faithful. God has given me faith in, me- in due measure well, as same. I've close, yeah. come closer mm-hmm. to him. See, I, w- I, w- I would say, even though it looked different, the fact that you were still suiting up and showing up, that is the faithfulness, right? Maybe because of someone else's experience, um, he knows better in that moment because he's seen how God has worked. Well, the other side of that Go too ahead. is yeah. that the beauty of a podcast is that I can share a story of where I handled it correctly. <laughs> so don't, don't get the, right. don't get the wrong. We need both sides of it, right? Because everybody's got to, right. But so look at verse 14 here. There's something to be said there because, uh, how does he say it? In the CSB. Yeah, sorry. yeah read it for us. Yeah. It says, most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. Like they were gaining That's the boldness. That's exactly to your point. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. They're gaining boldness because they saw it in, in his life. Like he went to jail and it, it could have just deflated everybody, right? We, we always talk about uh, the disciples at the day that Jesus was crucified and there, it was probably a rough day for them. However, I think we forget that we see time after time after time, these are the things that build faith. This is what created disciples into apostles was Good. seeing that and going through that adversity. Adversity, even outside of the biblical realm, it grows us. It's what makes us into who we are to a large extent. And, and it's also how God talks most clearly to me. Yeah. Well, this isn't, just a, this, this isn't just a prop you up, but for you, because I love you and care about you and you're a great leader and a huge asset to our church, I've watched you have to exhibit a high amount of trust if I can go there just in the last two months. So uh, we're, we're bringing on an executive pastor and we ask you to change roles. And- there's all the trust issues. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I just, you know, the way I think and you think, two different ways. Martin likes the roles and the job very clearly defined. And that's not bad. That's how God made you. And that's how you make me better, because I'm not good at that. I'm the stand on top of the mountain and we're going that way, boys. And I have no idea what the timeline is, what we're packing. <laughs> you know, what's the order of March? Right. I have no idea, right? Um, but I watched you through your experience and your trust, time after time say, okay, I'm going to do this. I love being a youth pastor. And then, okay, against my better judgment, fell in love with being a campus pastor. And then it's like, man, we really think, and what's the title again? I came up with <laughs> Operations <that>. and discipleship, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes. Discipleship and operations. Oh, order okay. matters. Past- yeah. <laughs> oh, pastor of <laughs> discipleship. <laughs> and uh, Victoria said they're calling you Poto now. Right. Poto. Yeah, Poto. I like that. Yeah, Pastor of Discipleship and Operations. Not sure what it means. Hasn't been fully defined. We kind of generally know what it is. You guys are working hard to define that. But you said to me, right upstairs, we're down in the dungeon, right upstairs in T1, you made a comment, hey, look, I'm just going to trust. And as I've thought about that moment, because I have seen you jump in, and I think you have Absolutely. as well, when you said, I'm going to trust, I think you might have been saying, John, I'm going to trust you and our leadership team um, that this is going to be a good fit and it's going to match my gifting. But I'd like to think you were really trusting God, that no matter how we screw this up, you're going to be okay. Yeah, full disclosure, I love you, uh, but that was 100%. (laughs) I'm going to trust God to sort through that. And not because anything's wrong. It's just, it's going to be hard. There's going to be bad days where I'm confused and frustrated with what's happening next. You know, anytime there's a staff change at a leadership level, it's going to be very difficult. Um, but we, we've made it super difficult. <laughs> we, we make everything. I have made it difficult. difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. You don't get to see on the other side of that how it's going to turn out. But I can look back and go, hey, being a campus pastor, like, I'm just going to say it. Youth pastor is the greatest job in history. I'm never sad I'm moving on. But you can't get better than that. Right? right, like you get to hey, work with. You're the, talking to two former youth yeah, pastors. The most malleable it. people. Like you're playing dodgeball. You're eating pizza every day. Everything's wonderful, except cleaning up the pizza. And that, yeah, but mm. the, yeah, most of the time. But then you get to a place where you look back and you're like, hey, uh, being a campus pastor was amazing. I got to care for our congregation and be a part of it in a different way than I could have ever imagined. And there were parts of it that, yeah, there were really rough days. But every one of those really rough days represents something in that world that, like, I, I text somebody today and I said. On, the only changes that matter in organizations are the ones that make it so you can make more of an impact, right? Mm. That's what everybody wants. 
that has a decent aspiration that's not just looking to climb a ladder because church world is not a place to There's climb no a ladder. ladder. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. So you got to want for something better to draw closer to Christ. and Or help others to do this. Exactly. Same, right? But learning along the way, yeah, it seems like a lot of fun. It's good. Real good. Yeah. I, I think, too, the, uh, as you were describing the experiences and how those uh, facilitate growth and trust in your life, um, you know, God has given us his word. Uh, he's given us creation. These are the two main aspects that we see him in. But as we look throughout scripture, there's this constant reminder of his promises that he's faithful. He promised and he's faithful. He's promised mm-hmm. and he's faithful. And I think when we're praying through uh, a prayer list, even that it's wise at times to say, okay, what did God say about the circumstance that I'm mm-hmm. in? Oh, this is what he said. And if he said this and he's never failed and he's never gone back on his word, then this is the promise that I'm going to cling to even in a, a struggle that I don't see the future and I don't see how this is all going to play out. Um, and that I believe, you know, when, with a person like Paul, there's enough of a recurring theme of God's faithfulness at this point that, you know, it's just kind of like, all right, let's He's go. Just all excited. Like, yeah, what's, yeah. What's next? I was Target okay rich after the ship rate, shipwreck. I was okay after the snake bite. I might be okay after prison. The yeah. third I got a feeling. Like, I'm going to be all right. Yeah. 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 Who knows? There may be an earthquake, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I might just, I might just stay yeah. instead of a jailbreak. Sorry. We're making a lot of New Testament references, but back Back to the uh, book here, Martin, and, and, and you made that transition. You said that there's something about watching someone trust God in circumstances that becomes a huge testimony or a huge domino impact or whatever. By my imprisonment, now other brothers are bold to speak. You would think it would be the opposite. You would think that the guys that from Paul's congregation or from that church or the other brothers were like, I don't want to get thrown in jail but maybe it's because they're watching how Paul reacted to it. Mm. And so he's, he's saying that by my imprisonment, um, these brothers are more bold to speak the word without fear. Have you se- Well, one of the reasons we're doing this podcast is you just heard Adam's testimony. You just heard Martin's testimony. Maybe someone listening right now is like, okay, I can at least show trust. Or you're hearing about the woman at the general store, right? Oh, I can do that. It, it it has this effect of making other people bold, at least within the faith. You know, that whole idea of in wartime, we have to stomp out the resistance. Uh, but if, if, if all of us are resisting the world, the power of the prince of the air, when they see one person doing it, even with fear, even not perfectly, but just being faithful, it has this way of emboldening others. Yes. I. And I have permission to share this name. And I know this because it was two weeks ago at church. A guy came up to me and shared with me his current diagnosis. And uh, it, it's a form of cancer. Um, it seems like that's it's just something I hear every weekend. But there was something different about this con- conversation because there was no fear. There was no concern. There was no sadness. There was a guy that 100% everything Adam has said would apply here. He's just mm. like, this is a new mission field. I'm going to have a whole bunch of doctors I get to talk to, and I'm going to talk to everybody with cancer and this and that and the other thing. He just, he, on and on and on, almost to a point where I'm just like, okay, I get it. Like, you're being faithful. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm glad. And then the next day, literally the next day, he's back for another service, and there's an in- individual that walks up to me and John Williams and is like, hey, I just had a diagnosis, and I don't know what to do. And he's a train wreck. Okay. Uh, I don't really know how to handle this beyond praying with you and being here with you. Let me introduce you to a friend. Introduction. The next week, the exact same situation happens, only this time it's, let me introduce you and your wife to him and his wife. Oh, that's cool. And it's just week after week after week, what he's going through, he's allowed to be a testimony, and it is bringing a level of encouragement to these other individuals. I'm just so thankful for guys like Grant Sheets that are willing to just go, hey, uh, my entire life is open book. You use me however you need to. Um, But yeah, I'll step right Mm. into that with whoever. Uh, yeah, I was diagnosed 12 minutes ago, but hey, seems like God <laughs> needs to use it. Let's go. Was it no. during the first ser- service? What? <laughs> <laughs> Hyperbole. I'm with yes. you. I'm with yeah. you. Sorry. No, yeah. it's good. So any th- that's awesome. Anything else on 12 to 14? I, I know that you even had some questions there. Is there a- anything else that uh, that we can glean out of there in the what's it mean part? No, I think the, I think we covered that pretty clear. It's Sweet. Good. So 15, then he changes his tact. And as we read, 
and actually I'll look over in the NLT, not the CBD Bible, but uh, uh, sometimes that puts it in everyday language. He says, it's true, some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. So apparently there was two camps, and I wonder even if the occasion of his letter, words getting out that, oh, that guy's preaching, maybe he's trying to make things worse for Paul. Um, but then he says some others have pure motives. Um, and in verse 16, he says, they preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. That just boggles my mind that someone would be in the church that would be that against Paul, that they're going to try and make life difficult for him in prison. But it doesn't seem like Paul cares. No. No, and and I'm surprised to hear you say that that's that mind-boggling to you because I feel like you take more shots than most of us, <laughs> right? Like you're the face, right, of the church, or at least the voice. And it's not a good one. No. <laughs> it's not a handsome one. <laughs> but that's why we do podcasts. I mean, there's video here, but it's— Hey, yeah. face made for radio is what they said. But sorry, what you're saying? No, yeah. you, but you do. You see that, unfortunately, the reality of human flesh gets in the way, and you do take shots. And there are people out there that will twist words that are said— you know, try to find ridiculous, out of context moments to try to to slow the advance of the gospel at the very least, and maybe they don't, they're not aware of that, or even not conscious of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a lot of times where it's just divisive, and that divisive piece, um, I, it, it frustrates me because I see that so often within churches, um, by and large. So it doesn't shock me that this is happening to Paul, but you're right. There's something very different about him. Like he doesn't have any desire to retaliate, to to worry about it. He's just like, no, nah, some of them are preaching out of goodwill. Some of them not so much. Um, and then he moves on. He just keeps going. He keeps preaching the gospel. Uh, yeah, I love the kind of the completing thought in verse 18 where he says, regardless of, he says, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. So he's saying, even with the poor motives, mm. Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. Um, you think about church history, and you look at yeah, the, let's go there. Yeah, <laughs> but throughout, if if there's success in any church, there's another church down the road that's saying they must be doing this, and they must be doing this, and they must be doing oh, this, yeah. and that's the only way that they're seeing the success that they're seeing. When I see a church firmly planted on the Word of God preaching the gospel and they have more people than we have. I don't care. Good for Preach them. the gospel. Yeah. Like it's a season of fruitfulness in that church and any true believer should be rallying and excited about it. This is, you know, we get so hung up on all the little uh, intricacies of, um, well, this had, that song had that word in it and this mm -hmm. song did this. And, and who wrote that yeah. song? <laughs> and <laughs> <use lights. laughs> and uh, those are conversations that are, are fun in our, mm -hmm. our service planning meetings. Um, but what do those conversations really do to serve the, the community and people that need the gospel? They mm -hmm. don't. And we get so caught up in some of that stuff. And I think even as Paul is looking at this, he's saying, you know, here's, here's these that are doing it out of selfish ambition. This, the purpose of them is literally to say, well, we don't like how Paul's doing it. And they're, they're coming against and attacking him. And he's sitting in prison watching people come to Christ. <laughs> and he's excited the whole time. Like, well, however I'm doing it through the power of the gospel, through the power of the Holy Spirit, it is being successful because God is being glorified and I'm going to keep doing it the way that I'm doing it. And yet in their attempts even to hurt Paul, Christ is proclaimed and he says, in that I rejoice. So he's able to sit back and watch this and still proclaim. Uh, there's still a joy there because Christ is being proclaimed. It's almost as if he's not focusing on the haters. Yeah, that's right. And he's just focusing <laughs> oh, on what's in front of him. it's so easy. Yeah. It's so... They're in, loud. Oh, yeah. And in my flesh and in my fear of man issues that wants everybody to like me, it's like, why did you put me in this role? Right. You know, just... But in whatever role you are in in ministry, um, this is a complete weird John observation. Okay, so forgive me if our executive producer, Lord Matthew Corey Hughes, um, needs to edit it out. I'm fine with it. <laughs> but since I was a missionary kid, third culture kid, I'm an observer of people. 
because when you don't know the language they're speaking, you got to read faces. Mm -hmm. And so that's the psychoanalysis of my counselor, right? But um, something that's hugely a, a, attractive about you as a person, Adam, is that um, in about the seven months that I've known you, whenever this man speaks about people coming to Christ, he gets this different kind of smile. The only other smile is when he talks about his wife or his kids because it's family. But you get this almost mm -hmm. giddy where you can't help but grin, whether there's tears in your eyes or no tears. It's what you just did there twice. I don't care. People are, I mean, it's almost <laughs> like, and so I'm imagining that it's, it's that same almost like sneaky little preacher's kid that got away with it. People are coming to Christ and they didn't know that, it, yeah, you know, that right. we were, you know, doing this little trick move. Not we're trying to trick people into the kingdom, but that's Paul's heart. And in speaking to churches, um, Example after example after example. We've been in the position at the tabernacle of this 20-year slow burn revival, campuses, whatever. Church like this has no business being in the sticks of northern Michigan. Well, that's only by God's grace and for his glory. And so we've taken the shots. But I would be completely dishonest if I would say I've never looked at a church and felt that way. And so one that I'll use is is – was probably the most convicting for me. So I won't say the name of the church, but you'll know. Um, he's the smiliest guy on television, and he's got a big church in Texas, and he writes books about, you know, happy clappy, you know, and and uh, and it's almost cult-like, like if you've ever watched a service, you know, everybody get your Bibles. And then and it's, I think you know it's, where I'm it's going. It's terrifying how yes. you're doing that voice, yeah, it, actually. It's terrifying, <laughs> but it's beautiful, you know, and he's got the little, you know, the eyes going, you know. And it's bad, but he w he was an easy target. And I'm not here to discuss the uh, the or the theological differences or the dangers or this and that and the other. But I remember speaking to a businessman one time, and he was sharing my I'll say it unhealthy disdain that this guy is preaching the gospel um, not from a good place. I don't think it's sincere. Um, we're just trying to make the biggest, baddest church in in Texas and all over television screens. And um, what this guy shared with me is he had a friend from India um, who was secular, but he was in the business world. All he had was Hinduism, um, but he wasn't even a practicing Hindu, um, but he was searching. And he just struck out on every opportunity with this guy till he saw him years later. And uh, the guy came to him with questions. He said, can you explain something to me from something in the New Testament? And he was shocked. Well, the guy on Sunday mornings had started watching this preacher that I'm like, oh, please don't go to the church, right? But that had opened the door. God was drawing this guy. And say whatever you want. Now his friend was in the Bible. Now his friend said yes to joining a Bible study. So it's it's and that almost, friend came to Christ. It's almost like the the Holy Spirit does the work. Mm, you you know, think it's crazy, <laughs> but it's almost like and you know, obviously none of us would um say, Hey, go hear poor theology. Right. Yet um Christ, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is uh, plan for the person's life. It's just beautiful to it's see. Beautiful. And yeah. it's the Holy Spirit that does that work. And it was a huge rebuke. Mm. for me because it was like okay i gotta ease up on that mm. that's not my you know that shouldn't be our game it's right. like whether it's good motives I, I god only god judges the heart mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure it says somewhere in here <laughs> <laughs> i know it says um but it's so easy to fall into that paul didn't fall into that trap and and this you know he's he speaks right to it when he says or or sorry you already read it that in every way whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Even with the bad songs, even with the songs from the churches that are way up, and, you know, and that's a huge war right now in church world, right. is should we play that song? Should we not? Here at the tab, we just try to judge each song on its merit, not on the motives of the writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we were to take every hymn to task, you know, and this is my personal opinion, but if I were to look at the life of every dead hymn writer from 200 years ago, uh, 
I, I don't think we're going to find anyone perfect but Jesus. You mean the old bar songs, hymns? Like, yes. Th- okay. Just, just clarifying, because it's funny how every generation picks a new you know, target on that, whether it be lights, hymns, rock, you know, I, music in general seems to be a uh, lightning rod there. But yeah, if Christ is being glorified, maybe get out of the way, stop throwing stones and just be really excited that, and here's the thing for me, I like to look around our community and go, Hey, we, we can be a starting point for a lot of people. Because we are, by others, considered sometimes just a seeker-friendly church. It's like, okay, I think that's an overestimation or oversimplification. Obviously, I haven't been to a service. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, by all means, we, we offend pretty much everybody equally. We're in First Kings for 47 <laughs> weeks. I don't think that's seeker-friendly at all. But, but if somebody walks through our doors and starts to be intrigued by this Jesus, and they end up having to go across the road or down the road to a different church— that's maybe more theologically conservative or just, you know, they like their hymns. Awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. Beautiful. Uh, we'll be the first one to introduce you to those folks um, and back and forth. And then you see when this is practiced out well, you see beautiful unity within churches. Like we've got a neighbor church that will have one of our pastors come over and assist when theirs is ill or otherwise. Um, we're a church that, hey, how can we help? Um, there's churches in Cadillac. Thank goodness. You know, I'm so grateful that God has planted them that see wildly different than us theologically and have yet been willing to support us. Oh, that's a good example. And yeah. partner with us. And what, what a cool thing is Pastor Isaac's over there trying to get his head on straight and he's got some friends and he's like, hey, we don't have to, you know, debate theology. Instead, how about we just talk about what Christ is doing within our community? I mean, there are just, there are so many people out there not believing. They, they're completely lost and blind to the gospel. And we're in here fighting about things they've never heard of. I don't think most people that are trying to figure out who Jesus is care about the end times, you know, Arminianism, Calvinism, the things that we find to bicker about in our worst days. Our intramural debates. Right. They're not varsity sports. Exactly. Um, But yeah, it's funny to me how quickly we can run down those roads. And Paul's just sitting here going, hey, when you're sitting in prison and the jailers are getting saved, none of that matters a bit. Not one word of it. Let's just, let's enjoy what's going on. I wonder what that celebration looks like. I actually, I read something recently. Uh, it was just a little quote that said, Paul entered heaven to the cheers of those he martyred. That's the gospel. Paul entered heaven to the cheers of the men and women that he martyred. These were mm. the people that he killed. Or had killed, yeah. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, Stephen's sitting there like, yeah, he made it. He made it. Told you guys. Probably not told you guys, but man, that's the gospel. And we're, we're arguing about lights and music. Right. And we do it in the church. We do it with other churches. Um, I don't care if the guy's got a hat while he's preaching or not. Britain, if you're listening, people need to see your eyes. But It's okay. You wear joggers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> joggers, if they're going to be distracting. Right. But for someone else. You know, what was so interesting is uh, uh, you, were, you were joking today about rocking the black hoodie and, and you were like, shout out to Britain because mm-hmm. he always preached in a hoodie. Black jeans, yeah. black shirt. You know, I did the whole thing. That's 100%. All, totally. On his last day, he had more than one guy come up and say to him, hey man, I'm going to miss you. You're one of the reasons I stayed because whenever you preached, you were in a Carhartt hoodie and I'm over here going, I got to get more car." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But it's like, no, no, you be you, you be you, I'll be me. And it's a perspective. Um, Martin, when you were talking there, I was thinking about that passage from Jude uh, chapter one, verse 23, where he uses the, uh, um, this vivid description of what happened when someone comes to Christ with the Adam smile, right? He says, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Um, that's always grabbed my imagination is uh, these, these motives aren't for me to judge together because no church is the church for everyone. That's why different churches are different. And I'm not, you know, uh, saying we should be all be church shoppers and the moment something makes, that's a different podcast. The moment something makes you mad, I'm moving. But find a church, get plugged in, and all of us together, the real mission is to snatch people from the flames in every possible way. This was Paul. 
you know, and I, I don't want to give any spo- spoiler alerts here, but we know wherever Paul went, um, he started a riot <laughs> or a revival. And so I imagine, and we know this, how many jailers um, thought that they were keeping Paul in prison, never realizing they were the ones in prison until right. they hear the gospel, mm-hmm. they meet Christ, the Christ in him, he introduces them, and now they're set free. So yeah. it's like how many imperial guards, you know, started a little fight club right there in, where is he, Rome, I guess, right. you know? What other questions you got on that list that might be good for us? Well, I was going to even mention that, um, you know, in throughout the, old, the New Testament, Paul even uh, criticizes um, those that use godliness as uh, a means of financial gain. So they're, they're, you know, he criticizes the ones that are speaking heresy. He criticizes uh, false teachers that literally are teaching something contrary to the gospel. And I think even with like what Martin's sharing, it's so important. We're not saying that uh, the the doctrine of scripture right. is something that is um, that we're weak on. Right. We're simply saying that the divisiveness amongst uh, churches, even in a surrounding area like this, we fight over the littlest things mm. that have no bearing on the gospel. And I love what you shared from Jude, because it's literally, yeah. if you have right perspective on the soul of humanity without the gospel, you are literally plucking them from uh, the punishment of fire. Right. And so that has to be my motivation and my passion. And all these little discussions in the fray mm. of that are nothing more than a distraction from what we're called to do. Right. And, um, and you know, what Paul says even is that the process of him enduring the punishment and of imprisonment is emboldening mm. the ministers of the gospel mm. so that they are, um, uh, one, uh, writer said, um, FF Bruce, he says that, uh, thanks to my imprisonment, he's speaking of Paul, the, majority of my brethren have plucked up courage to proclaim the message of God all the more fearlessly. Mm. And so watching his responses to the imprisonment is emboldening them and they're sharing more and they're sharing more. And so Paul's even seeing that and that's another motivator to his joy, another piece, puzzle piece to his joy. It's, it's mm. almost as if Paul <clears throat> is hyper aware that he's on display. And again, I'm just thinking of my own experience. Growing up a missionary kid, um, as a white kid in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, I'm automatically a minority. And so in the 70s, early 80s, uh, I lived there until I was 14. When I'm out and about, not at the international school that I went to, but when I'm with my parents going to Haitian church or I'm accompanying dad to the north or to the south or on a mules up into the mountain. You see a couple of white guys, you have an automatic crowd. They watch every response. And culturally, there was a little funny, you know, like in church, they would love to, you, you know, if I'm sitting in the congregation, you can expect at some point a little kid is going to reach up behind you and pull your hair just to touch it, one, because hair is different, and to see what I'll do or to pinch me or one of my sisters because- you know, you pinch white skin and you're like, oh, look, it turns red. No, it doesn't. No, do it to him and see what, I mean, that's happening in the middle of a message, you know? And so I became hyper aware that my responses, and they weren't always good because I was still a little wicked sinner, right? My responses are on display. And what I'm not proposing is now in my journey that we be false. But there's something important about how Christians are observed by the world when we face maybe not imprisonment, but maybe, Mm. maybe imprisonment, maybe adversity, maybe persecution, cancer. And, and, and when you put it back in that perspective that no, we're on display, Paul, Paul speaks of that somewhere. Uh, uh, when, when, when he talks about being an ambassador for Christ Mm. and, and ambassadors in chains, right. Um, that, that we're on this parade and he calls himself and his fellow workers were the least, you know, that are brought up at the end, mm. but we're on display and we're on display for a reason. Not that everyone cares about my responses, but if you're known to have a relationship with Christ, they're watching. That's right. How is he or she going to respond in this circumstance? Mm. And so it's so easy to make it about me. 
and my pain and my lack of trust. Mm. Um, and even from Paul's experience, I want to be emboldened. Sorry, I jumped to the application too, but. No, what you just said though, and I think looking at it's Ephesians 6.20, I had to look that up. I always like to admit that. Um, for which I am, a, am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. This is Paul, and somebody else can help me with timeline, whether this is before or after that moment. But this is Paul going, hey, I'm going to need you guys to pray for me because this is not going to be easy. Like He is acutely aware that the, in these moments, we have to be prayed up, prayed for, taken care of, and be prepared to make those decisions because whether it's chains. And as you're sitting there talking about that, John, I'm going, yeah, what's the adversity I face? And I'm thinking about the basketball game we played last night getting our tails hammered by uh, TC. Wait, and you playing or coaching? Coaching. Okay. Coaching you. eighth grade girls. And uh, we, we had a rough night last night. We we're just getting destroyed. And the refs were what you would consider maybe not calling a whole lot. Um, but let the ones. Play. What's that? Let them play. By all means. <laughs> let them, <laughs> let it's them play. Eighth grade girls. If you guys have ever watched this, it's literally bumper cars <laughs> with a basketball. It's, they can't even control their bodies. It's yeah. brutal. And, and don't get me wrong. My girls were playing great. They were holding their own. But. When everybody gets worked up about refs, I'm typically the guy that can hold my cool. However, last night, as I can hear this woman behind me yelling one of my players' numbers, who's in tears already, like she's crying because we're losing and she's just trying, because eighth grade girls have a lot of emotion um, and I'm just getting hot. Like I'm just, and I just turn around and I'm staring at her and I'm thinking to myself, everybody is watching how you respond right mm. now. Not the least of which my other coach who's sitting there and he's, he's a little bit more hot tempered with the refs and stuff. Like he's got a little bit more to say. And I'm like, everybody is watching. It's like, don't pretend you're not annoyed. Just don't react. Right. And, and in those moments, sometimes I think it's important for us to just realize, yep, we're all being watched. Don't be false about it. Don't pretend. But how we carry ourselves in those moments matters. What we actually, how we actually choose to respond in it. And I did not curse at any refs, good job. parents, or anybody else. So still I feel like a it was job, a good day. So good yep. job. Yep. <laughs> Todd Frazee's listening somewhere. <laughs> yeah. What other questions you got on there? Um, so, there, are just how do we apply it? Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot of um, you know there's some conversation around where Paul was imprisoned. Uh, there's two things in verse uh, chapter one, verse thirteen talks about the Praetorian Guard um, that we've referenced already, and then in chapter four, uh, he references Caesar's household. Oh, um, yeah, and so probably uh, he's writing this at the latter part of his imprisonment in Rome. Um, but as we continue in Philippians, we'll see that there's that, that very real, and you alluded to this early on, there, that very real existence of the fact that um, this will likely end in his execution. Mm. Caesar is not known to have a second appeal before him um, if he's already ruled. Um, and so I think even just the um, urgency that Paul demonstrates in the way that he's speaking and, and the way that he's sharing the gospel and keeping that um, as the, the priority in both his testimony, the way that he is an ambassador, um, the way that he knows people are watching him uh, and respond to this. Um, he's, uh, working, striving to end well, um, mm -hmm. with that very real, um, uh, possibility of this being the last years or days of his life. And, um, I think for any of us application wise, like, None of us knows the time of the hour. Right. Um, we don't know how much time we have on this earth yet in the face of eternity. Um, you know, whether it's the national average is just like 72.5 years or something like that. Yeah. Um, Dang, I'm doing math right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's really funny because I've used this example a lot with teenagers. I'm like, we have 72.5 years. And as I get older, I'm like, whew, I'm under 30. Yeah. <laughs> I've got 30 left to go, you know, last, less I'm than I'm in that. the third quarter. Yeah. <laughs> Time's uh, winding down. <laughs> but the, um, the things that are accomplished and done for Christ um, matter for eternity, whether that's in the way that we live for our families, whether the, it's in the way that uh, our coworkers see us exemplify a relationship with Christ. Um, that's, that has to be the motivating source of why we live and why we do what we do. Um, and Paul exemplifies that so well here. I think that's a, just one piece of the application that's there. Yeah. 
one of, one of the things I find myself um, thinking about in the application is with the dramatic, and I'm not criticizing the Bible, but this is a dramatic example. Most of us in this room will not be imprisoned, hopefully, but we'll see, uh, for the cause of Christ, or to be tortured or stoned or a real live riot. Um, I mean, I can do another War Stories episode where, you know, I, th- I think I was telling you my first three months here, I got a phone call uh, from someone in this community who said, what do you care if kids are going to hell when I'm the youth group, mm. or sorry, when I'm the youth pastor? And uh, I was like, well, this is what I'm called to do. And he was so opposed that at one point in the phone call, he said, um, we're going to run you out of town. And then he said the words, I'm going to hang you. And then I'm thinking, should I call the, like when we hung up, am I, is, that was a death threat, right. <laughs> you know? Okay. So I have gotten a death threat. Now he may have been on the sauce at the time. I'm not sure. So I don't know if that would hold up in a court of law, but to the point, it may not be this dramatic, right? But what about in the everyday circumstances? I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of a specific example. I know it's happened a ton where I'm so single-minded, uh, you know, me and the guys, we're going to go somewhere, the car breaks down or, you know, we're going to hunt and then the weather is wrong and instead we're stuck indoors. And it's easy for me in those little everyday imprisonments where I'm off of my agenda or what we might say here, the interruption. Oh, I got a sermon to write. I got these things to do. And then someone walked in and I'm the only one here and I get roped into a conversation or it could happen at the lobby at church or on the sideline of a soccer field. It's easy for me to forget on my good days. It's like, wait a minute. We call them like divine appointments. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had one of those where you were totally focused here and then all of a sudden I'm in a conversation and I realize the conversation and whatever my agenda was is it's not about that. Here's someone that doesn't know Christ and I've got an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Like I see those as applications out of this mm-hmm. is to have that. And I don't know if intentionality is the word because I wasn't intentional. It's more like, okay, God, I think I see where you're, oh, this is why I'm here. Awareness. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's just like, hey, I'm, I'm going to keep my eyes. I'm going to keep the radar up for what God's doing around me. My wife is really good at this. Like my wife is way better than me at, at just paying attention in the moments to like, all right, I think that this might be God opening a door somewhere along the way. And uh, for me, I often, you know, my immediate thought is like, all right, what's in front of me? What needs to be done? And being a task oriented person by nature, I can easily get caught in that. But sometimes I just need that little tap on the shoulder and she'll sick me on people. Like it's, Mm -hmm. I'm the one that wants to have the conversation, but sometimes I have to be made aware because my radar is not up. I'm focused on me, my thing, my job, what what needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, Honestly, there was a good example of that a few weeks ago. We're, I'm sitting over at T2 trying to put a Christmas tree uh, together before fight night. Um, We've got a big event. I'm, some people had to go home sick that day. Things had to be done. I'm just trying to stuff a Christmas tree in a box, which is miserable. Who Like, why do people have fake trees? Mm. Anyway, so trying to stuff this thing in, and this little old lady knocks on the door, and I'm 90% she, there. She's going to just pick up her grandchild from the preschool. And she walks through the door, and she begins to sob. And immediately, it's just, I'm... I can't miss that one, right? Like, thank you, Lord, for giving me at least that level of awareness to where it's like, all right, let's sit down. One of the best, like most pastoral moments I'm going to have any time to just sit with this woman and make a new friend. And she's amazing. And she's a woman of God. And she's just scared and she's struggling. And she's got some surgeries coming up. But I could have so easily missed that. I think of how many days that building would have had nobody to answer the door. I think of exactly how God ordained those moments. And in them, I'm grateful that he has my, you know, Again, he's got to hit me square in the face. My wife, she's got like intuition. I guess women have that. I don't. Um, but it's one of those moments where I just go, all right, yeah. And I agree. I think that those are much more likely that we have imprisoned ourselves by our own hmm. one-track mind of I have to get this done or you know, whatever else. Or I'm just in a crummy mood. Like hmm. Some days it's just a crummy mood that keeps me from paying attention to the humans around me. It's hmm. good. Instead of listening, yeah. So, but what's it mean for you? 
for me, it's not only the trust combo, which I didn't see coming, which I liked mm. a lot, um, to trust God with the interruption, with the persecution. I pray for grace if I get the cancer thing. You know, I've, I mean, we've had enough people in our lives that I've watched some pretty stellar saints um, and the way that they've used everything that happened. I mean, I'm thinking of Tim Burgess, uh, where, where he, he wouldn't care if I'd share this message, but as he goes for his arthritis treatments, he was sharing with us a couple years ago how his attitude was, I'm not able to do as much as I can at the church. I can't, I'm missing meetings. You know, uh, they're changing his meds again, and the only place is a drive to Frankfurt. And and I watched him. He he didn't use these words, but he said to me, "I needed a change of attitude." And it's not thousands. It's not, you know, stream live to Manistee and Cadillac. But I have three people that have to care for me for these next, or that are in a room. The one caring for me, and the two others receiving treatment, and I've got a mouth. Mm-hmm. And so, how do I build a relationship with them? That emboldened me that because I can't imagine going through what he's going through and only by God's uh, grace and providence or his discernment. John can't handle this. <laughs> we'll give it to Tim. Right. But watching him do that um, reminds me of this. I want to be that way in those everyday moments. What about for you guys? What are the takeaways for us or for our podcast fam? Yeah. Um, I'm going to let them decide their own. Uh, there's always more than enough for me. And I think it was something that Adam said when he pointed out um, God's promises. Like that repetitious cycle in Scripture of when we read God's promises and we see what he has done. And and I just can't hear that often enough. Um, I've preached it myself. It cuts me every time. The, the need I have to be reminded on a daily basis is embarrassing. I need God to to coddle me like a child way too often and go, hey, remember, I took care of you the last time there was a job change, there was a this, there was a that, there was a that. And and I'm not embarrassed of that anymore. Um, In fact, as Paul ends this, he talks about being unashamed. Um, My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body whether in my life or in my death. He's talking about, all right, I might die out of this, and I hope that that brings honor to God. I'm just going to, I hope that I can let go of my ego enough to be embarrassingly in need of God to remind me. Because, and I've said it before, we keep a journal in our house that we don't write in enough than all the things that God's done for us. Hmm. And we talk about it often so that my kids can steal a little bit of what God's done because at 6, 9, 12 years old, not easy to look back on everything God's done yet. And I hope we do a good job of that. And I couldn't care less if that gets annoying, overbearing, they hear it too often, or if our congregation does. If The only thing I'm screaming is God has done everything for me, everything for me along the way. And I'm glad he does because I'll forget tomorrow if he doesn't. And that somehow brings him glory and points people to him. Good. The life was worth living. Uh, I'm just glad that he keeps reminding me because I am a short-sighted human. He's incredibly patient. Yeah, it's good. I think just a that constant reminder to be faithful and um, in the day-to-day, we can allow the process to overcome our ability to see people and to slow down and just have those conversations. Um, you know, I try to... Uh, I love that I'm a pastor because one of my favorite little techniques is to ask people, oh, so what do you do in the area? And just hoping that they reciprocate and ask, what do you do? Well, it just so happens. <laughs> just um, so, right, right. But, uh, and then, which gives me opportunity to invite. Um, but there are times where, you know, just like last night at the gym, had that conversation and the guy's like, oh, dude, that's awesome. I just moved here. I'm looking for a church. Sweet. What if I would have just put my shoes on and turn my back on the guy? Because it can be a little bit awkward, you know, in the locker room. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Especially but, at the Y. <laughs> yeah. But just have, uh, you know, the conversation piece that's there and take the take that extra second to ask and um, hadn't seen him before. And mm-hmm. so that kind of led into the conversation um, and he plans to be here Sunday. So, wow. but I just think the... Uh, being faithful in that, you know, we, we have it so good. 
Uh, we really do. It won't, we're not going to face what Paul faced most likely in our lives, as you already stated. Mm. Um, why, why then does it, you know, even in that he's faithful in my life, you know, I'm worried about what the weather might do and how that might affect my outdoor pursuits. Right, right. You know, right. just simple, silly things. Um, we have to be faithful mm-hmm. and uh, never let that process uh, overwhelm us to the point that we miss the people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole the whole context uh, of, of this passage, right? The, the little heading that man has added in my translation is it's the advance of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And it's not just Paul. It's not just pastors. It's all of us looking for those opportunities despite our circumstances to advance the gospel. Last, last little story, a member of our own congregation was telling me, uh, I think it was just last night or the night before, um, his own experience at the gym. You made me think of this. And uh, there, was a, there was a teenage boy, about 16, looking frightened in the big, wherever you guys train. I think he trains the same place as you do. And uh, a, a very large, loud-mouthed meathead who had some anger issues um, was probably Royden, <laughs> uh, out of the blue, just, you know, went off on this kid about taking too much time on a machine or something, you mm-hmm. know, and, um, my friend who's not afraid, uh, to be a man, uh, s- saw this kid looked scared to death. There's a grown man, you know, given who, why, and what for to a 16 year old. And he kind of stood up for the kid and, you know, he just intervened and said, no, it just, you, you need to go away. And, and. You know, I won't get into that part of the story, but the kid was super grateful. And, um, the next time he saw him at the gym, saw my friend wearing a Christian t-shirt and he was like, and he asked him, he said, oh, are you a Christian? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, me too. And, you know, so they talked a little bit. He says he sees him all the time now and he's noticed the kid's starting to wear his cheesy Christian (laughs) t-shirt. He's been emboldened because of watching him do the same. And so it doesn't always have to be in those, um, those big dramatic Bible moments, but we're living just as dramatic moments when we think about that people need to be snatched from the fire. Mm. Um, so yeah, this is, a, this is a good little passage. I'm glad we chose Philippians. Um, one, of, one of my favorite little sign-offs uh, that Paul gives is uh, one of the, uh, yeah, it's the very next book in Colossians, the very last verse. Um, when he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Mm. Grace be with you. I can never read that verse out loud without feeling it. Yeah. Remember my chains. You know, and so when I'm like, oh, taking the shots like you mentioned, oh, I'm not in chains yet. Right. You know, so we can keep doing what we're doing. We can keep being called to be faithful. So, yeah. so thanks for your thoughts. Martin, you were saying you've never been on here for a study. Right. You're going to be on again. Mm. You have deep thoughts, Pastor. Yeah. These are fun. Uh, you know, it's or is it Reverend? Are you Reverend now? Uh, yeah, new job title. New, yeah, we should go with that. I think Reverend works. <laughs> no, it's Poto. No, that's actually yeah, Poto. it's Poto. I like yeah, Poto. it's Poto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm. thanks, uh, Slayer. What do they make? Uh, they make game calls. I was actually going to make this you, little. You got this. That's a that's an awesome hat, Benji. We need like that this. hat. I like Did you this. see that hat? I was going to make a little Slayer, come um, parallel with the uh, pseudo ambassadorship that I'm rocking over here. Slayer, no with, free shout outs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't yeah, think he's it's, free. It's, I'm just going to level with you. I think, he, I think there's already money going out somewhere here. <laughs> Thank you, Slayer, for keeping Adam closed. Yes, yes, yeah, yes we good. love it. Okay, well, that's all we have for now. Thanks for uh, being with us. Um, Adam, Martin, that was, uh, that was some good stuff. And so we're supposed to share this. Um, subscribe to it, share it with a friend if it was a blessing to you. If it was crap, then just don't. And then we'll just try to do better next time. But somebody might like it. Share it anyway. Somebody might like it. it. Even if they need a Slayer game call. Exactly. Uh, So it it is a game call. So it's it's not just ducks. Because I see a caribou. Elk. No, it's an elk. Yep. Elk and turkeys, ducks, geese. Can you make an elk call right now without one? And awkwardly. That's I what could. I was hoping. Yeah. That's why I asked. Like, <laughs> no, I can do the turkeys <laughs> better. <laughs> and she's over there. He's like, no. No singing. <laughs> All right. Until next time, Tab family, this is Adam Ray, Martin Rizzi, Benjamin, and myself signing off. Mm-hmm.